Um, hello, my name is uh, Conrad Feiler. I'm really happy that you all came here. The room is full. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how I fit a million stars into an iPhone. Um, I tricked you a little bit. This is like a very fancy title. It's really going to be about how to reduce the memory size of your app. But of course, we have a nice example why we're doing this, and that's, that's a good reason. And for, first, a little bit maybe about me. Um, as I said, my name is Konrad Feiler. I'm from Berlin. My first app was in the store 2010. And when I wrote this, I actually felt very old because I was like, oh, has it already been that long? And I worked a lot for media companies in the past. Um, and uh, I also work a lot with OpenGL, with 3D, with AR, VR, and um, also Functional Swift. And um, yeah, if you have any of these things that are interesting to you, then I'm really happy to talk afterwards. And I have. Um, Two companies now, the one is about eye health and, and uh, using technologies to detect eye things. And I have another company where I do like my own uh, things. And this is one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today. So uh, today, the focus is really on uh, how can we make our apps faster and how can we use less memory. So I will talk about a few general points on optimization. I will also uh, give you the example problem, which is a really pretty one, so that we all have a motivation to go for the like, slow um, code and, and uh, look at all the lines of code. And I will explain to you how we can use this memory layout struct in uh, Swift to learn more about how our structs are uh, laid out in memory, how the AI, how the, how the computer is doing this. Um, we then will optimize one particular example. We go really into the deep dive of one struct example and see how we can optimize this one. And then we hopefully have some pretty results and it's all been worth it, all this like minutes. And uh, so, and then that's, that's the overview. And then first we can ask ourselves, okay, why do we want to optimize code? Because this is not what we want. We don't want to sit the user in front of something where it says like loading because I have to do something. So uh, we want to have shorter loading times. That's one reason that we want to optimize code. Uh, another reason that we want to optimize code is, is maybe that we have a difference in quality. Quality could be images, it could be audio, it could be AI. You can imagine if you can make your AI uh, optimized, that means you can do more things. You can maybe uh, uh, calculate more turns ahead in a, in a game or something. So optimization is very important for better quality. Um, the another thing, and this is a very important one, optimization is very important for the battery life. So in this example, this is like a nice picture from um, Vulkan actually, so an Android picture, even though I'm an iOS developer. And um, you can see here that they, they compared like Vulkan to OpenGL AS, and OpenGL AS is not very optimized for a mobile platform. And even though the picture is the same one, in both cases the graphics are the same, in one case the uh, power consumption of the chip, you can see this like little graphics here, is uh, in the green area, and here's in the red area, even though we do the exact same thing. And uh, in my first app, I did something similar. I actually turned the uh, frames per second of my game to zero while the user's thinking. It was like a game like chess where the user has like units that they can move around. And so you have to think about if you have like a 3D engine, for example, it's totally valid to say, I just turn everything to zero frames per second as long as nothing's happening. While the user's like staring at the screen thinking, okay, should I move the king first or the pawn first? If I'm too fast, you have to interrupt me because, uh, okay, then just like look angry at me or something and I know I will speak slower. And um, so this was all about why we want to optimize code. And um, the main feature for today is like sometimes you want to optimize something because without optimization, it wouldn't even be possible. So you want to enable advanced features that weren't possible without optimization. Um, the example I will show to you, well, that, that's the core of this talk today. But these other examples before are also important reasons. And the most important thing to keep in mind is something that uh, the elder Donald Knuth, Knuth said. Um, we should forget about small efficiencies, and often it's 97% uh, it, of the optimization is not important. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. And that's really, think about this, premature optimization is the root of all evil. There's like these 3% of cases that we really should optimize, and then the rest of the times, we really want to write understandable, safe, and testable code. That's our, that's our task. We are like mobile developers. We are not here to write some, uh, like, I don't know, spaceship that goes into space and it has to be like, uh, I don't know, something. We, we want to make sure that our company doesn't have to um, 
pay a lot of money on, on maintenance on, on very complicated code that we wrote because uh, first of all, it should be understandably safe and testable. And uh, like I said, programming costs time. If you spend a lot of time optimizing something that's really not important, you're wasting your company's time or you're wasting your own time. And uh, also you have to mind faster code often is more complex. I will give you some examples in a minute about this. So the important point to learn here is pick your battles, know when you have to spend some time on something and when you should really not spend time on it. Um, so yeah, what can we optimize for? We can optimize for performance. So optimize for performance, that means CPU cycles. You do this, and if you're an Xcode developer, an Apple developer, you have this nice uh, instruments program. You open instruments and you use the time profiler, for example, to find uh, which part of your program is using the most CPU cycles. This is not a talk about instruments, so I will only show you that this is where you go. There are really nice uh, WWDC lectures where you can learn all about the details of this instruments program. There's lots of little hooks you can set and um, I don't have, like that would be its, its own talk to talk about these instruments. Um, and of course CPU cycles are important to reduce the loading time, to reduce battery consumption and uh, to increase maybe the frames per second of your app. Uh, the other thing that you can optimize for is memory. And uh, this is important of course for uh, because you might not fit on the phone, but you also have to remember that the more m memory you use, the easier or the earlier iOS will kill your app. Like if you're in background mode, iOS will uh, basically have this list of which apps are currently open. And if you are using a lot of memory, it, your app will be one of the first ones that goes away when the user does something else. So if you have less memory, it will stay longer in the background mode and doesn't have to be like restarted. Um, I mean, on modern machines, this is maybe less important, but it's still something to remember. And uh, maybe we even want to program for the Apple Watch. And so for the Apple Watch, you have a very small device and uh, with very little memory, so then you have to optimize. Um, and then there's another reason why you might want to optimize for memory. And I have made a very small test example here because sometimes using very little memory means that you are having a very fast program. And to illustrate this, uh, I just defined some very basic uh, structs here. So you can see there's an, I hope everyone can see this. I was, um, there's an element eight. I named it eight because it's, uh, this structure there is eight bit uh, in size because an integer here is just uh, a bit of one, no, eight byte, sorry, uh, eight byte. And then there's the in element 16 and 32 and 48 and 512. So these are all, um, 8 byte, 16 byte, 32 byte, 48 byte in memory. If you would look at these uh, structures, I will show you how to do this later. And important to note now is that if you uh, run some code like this, where you just sum up all the ends, of course we can do this faster. The point is just here that like, let's just measure how long it would take the computer if we had like an element uh, array of 10,000 elements and we just sum up this one integer. And really important to note is here, I have these other integers like M and K and L, and I don't actually use them. Those are just like assume we have a very big struct and we sum them all up and this is, we measure this and then uh, we can do some nice uh, statistics about this. The uh, project for this is also in the folder with the rest of the talk. I will link to this later. So if you don't trust me, don't believe me what's happening there, you can run it on your own machines and see how it looks in your own machines. Um, this is, I think, on my iMac. And then you can see here, I plot the uh, size. This was this element eight with one integer, and this was this with four integers, and the size goes uh, up of the structure. And this is the time that I took. But now we, of course, know in each of these cases, we actually run the exact same number of operations. So our CPU was doing the exact same number of plus, 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 plus. It's always like this 10,000 up uh, addings. And now we can ask ourselves, huh, our struct increased in size, but we were really doing the same operation. Why is the end of this graph showing a longer time? And now I can ask maybe some of you, what's like, do you have like one word why this is happening? Someone has a, hmm? Yeah, so, uh, 
yeah, memory layout, exactly. So, I mean, the word I know for this is called level one, level two cache. So you have to imagine, I, I could have mentioned this earlier also, I, I, I did, at some point I did study mathematics and we were doing a lot of performance optimization. So for me back then, this was like something very standard that I hear a lot about. So basically uh, you have your CPU and see you on your CPU directly on the die in the hardware on your motherboard, there is a little bit of memory, which is called level one, level two cache. Sometimes there's a level three and a level four cache. The point is just like inside of your chip, there's a small memory which can also store data. And then there's this long line and this is going, you know, all the way over your motherboard where these like little uh, lines are connecting to the main memory to the RAM. So this would be the RAM and this is inside of your chip. And this, uh, the chip, asking the memory, hey memory, can you send me this small array here? This takes a lot of time to do this step. So if you can fit this small memory, for example, this small array inside this cache, then the CPU can then do this uh, loop that we just wrote very quickly. It can do, yeah, here it can go and like just fetch everything of this from the level two cache that the data never has to leave the actual chip and we are very fast and let's, the comparison would be, okay, let's assume we have a very big array in the memory and um, there, we, then the chip has to fetch like a first part of this uh, memory, put it in here and then take it out and fetch the next one and then put it out and fetch the next one and fetch the next one. There is a term for this in the, like really, the, these, these hits on the main memory you want to uh, reduce if you want to have fast programs, there are cases and this is like a, very uh, basic test case that I wrote for this to illustrate that this is really happening even in our modern machines with a Swift code. And it's, it can be a very simple example, but it makes a difference for you. So uh, now we can ask ourselves, okay, uh, we learned all of this. Um, this means sometimes when we reduce the memory of our individual structs and we have a large array, then our program will execute faster when we do something with this large array or any collection really, any time where we have like a big collection. And um, then we have other cases where, which we have to remind ourselves where maybe sometimes the speed of our program and the memory it uses are working against each other. This can happen, I, like a really, really basic example, everyone has seen this before. This is a lazy var in Swift, which is lazily calculated, which means the first time someone accesses this, this function is called, and then this object is stored here. And then we have this example where we just have a uh, variable that is a calculated variable, so every time you access this object, it is calculated again. There is no storage here at all. And then we can basically ask ourselves, okay, does it take really, really long to call this method? Or is this object that we're storing really big? And we have to make a decision which of these two approaches is the better one for us. And this is a very basic example. You can imagine the same thing happens for really any type of cache you might have on your local machine or on your server. Is it easier to like calculate it again on the fly? Or is it better to store this? And you have to see what is your current system restriction. And um, yeah, so some, for example, all caches, simplest, yeah. Now, the next part is the re most important thing about um, optimizing anything on your computer, uh, that you to keep this uh, optimization loop in mind. First, you go into your program, you profile measure. In Xcode, you would do this with instruments where you see, okay, what is currently my bottleneck in my program? You basically order it by the amount of time it the all methods in your program take, and then you look at the top one, and you t first you uh, optimize the top one. Um, and everyone, I assume, many of us have done this, that they saw, oh, but I can totally, this other method, I can see a way of writing this faster. It doesn't matter if it's not the top problem, if it's like, you know, 3% of your time, of the time that the program takes, spends in this method, then you don't have to optimize it. And then when you have identified a bottleneck, you form a hypothesis, you look at your code and you think, eh, maybe if I change this here, it will be faster. But then after you change this, you also go back and you see, okay, is it actually faster? So you form a hypothesis like in science where you do like, okay, I have my hypothesis, I do my experiment and then I check what was the result. And then you do this again and again and at some point the bottleneck will be going away and then the next thing is the bottleneck and the next thing and you. Uh, it's important to remember this cycle and to not go out of it because this way you use your time very efficiently. 
And the next thing, of course, uh, Eva already just talked about this, and this is another reason why unit tests are really great. Unit tests are great while you do performance optimization. Let's assume we have some function heavy calculation here. I didn't put, I, we will have more detailed code later, but this is just the idea. Uh, there is an input and an output. And we now have a unit test that tests that when we put different inputs, the correct outputs come out of this program. And um, maybe where I did the circle here, there's like some really heavy calculation going. Maybe we do some AI code here with like 10 layers of uh, trees of, of deepness or something, and we really optimize this away, but we still want our AI to make the right decisions. So every time we test, oh, every time we test, we uh, make sure that while we are optimizing, we don't break anything. And uh, in the main example that to which I will come now, this is really what I did. And you can even see that I actually did break some. If you look into my git commit histories, you will see that sometimes I actually broke things because some of my uh, optimizations uh, had like bugs in them and had introduced bugs. So unit tests are really great and important. So now the cool part, uh, the main example, um, we will look at this large uh, star database. And um, for this, I will do a little bit of a demo. Hopefully that works. Live demos are always scary. And this is an app that is built on top of what I will talk to you afterwards. And let's see, okay, so there's you. I can see all of you. And now it's measuring the room. And okay, so there we have our solar system. I mean, if I hold it like this, you can see that it's all of you and there's a solar system, of course. Um, and you can see all of these little uh, stars here in the sky and they all are data points in my memory, and maybe if you want, we can even uh, deselect this. And then, yeah, I can even select, and there's like millions of stars in this database where you can scroll through, and uh, I wanted to get them all in here, but I also wanted to have this AR kit session running. I also wanted to load very pretty 3D objects. So in my program, I couldn't have this star database be very big. And maybe we can make a picture for later with you guys and the universe, and I will just save this to my photos and later send it to the conference um, organizers. Yeah, so this, is, this was just a demonstration why we now spend all this time, because if we don't spend all the time later, then this is not possible. So this is like the result of, uh, I showed you the cake first, and now we still need to bake it or something. Um, yeah, let's go back into the talk. Um, more details on this big uh, database. Um, it is a large database with many columns. We can imagine all the stars that we can see on the naked eye, if, especially here, I guess. If you go somewhere to Siberia where there's no villages and no, no buildings around, you can see maybe 8,000 stars. And when I used this in the beginning, it was 1.8 megabyte, it's perfectly fine. But then I thought, okay, but in the virtual reality, I can show you more. I can show you the stuff that you can actually only see with a telescope. Um, this is called, like this 120,000 is a rough thing. There's like this famous Hipparchos catalog that's already pretty old. But then there's also more modern uh, databases. There's like a Tycho database, it's called, which is like 2.5 million stars. Um, um, and that was collected in 1993. I think at the moment we know like 10 million, but they were, those are not open source. So the open source databases that I was able to find had this 2.5 million stars. And you can already see, uh, this 560 megabytes just for the database will be problematic, especially if we also want to have maybe an app around with ARKit and with SceneKit and all these other things that also need memory. So we have to start optimizing here. And um, in order to optimize, we have to first know, okay, we can measure our general program, but then we want to know how do we measure the size of one individual struct. So um, we know, okay, this is the so-called uh, size function in Swift. In order to get the size of something, you can, rep, uh, you can create a memory layout struct. Um, it's a generic, which takes your uh, struct as a generic input, and you call the dot size function to get the exact size. But then maybe um, this is just the size of one individual item, and we maybe are more interested in this thing called stride. And stride is, uh, is another uh, variable of this struct, 
And I did a little bit of a demonstration so that you can see, okay, you know, the size is really our the size of our one object. And if we put those into an array, it doesn't just add them together, but it adds this little bit of overlay so that each of them are properly aligned. And um, then the stride is always a little bit more. And then we can write a nice formula that says, okay, um, the count of our uh, how many elements we have times the stride is the size of the overall array. And um, I guess, yeah, maybe who of you has like worked with this memory layout thing here before? Who has run this? Okay. Um, I don't know, this is like a very detailed thing that you can do when you really want to know exactly how large this is. Again, in the talk later, uh, if you go into my GitHub, I will send you a link. There's a playground for this, and you can also see uh, how you can do this in your own code. Um, this is the big structure of this uh, of one star. It's not really important what these individual um, elements are for you right now. Uh, the importance is to more see the type. So we have these floating variables that, to, uh, that are basically the coordinates of your star in the sky. It's like, you know, in the latitude and in the longitude. And then there is a bunch of IDs and then there is a classifications, the proper name, you know, our sun is called Sol, and there's like Vega and Arcturus and many other stars in the sky that have proper names. And we have a distance and we have uh, magnitude so that we can show them in the graphics in the right size. And then we have color index so that we know if it's more like a bluish star or orange star. Point here is that the stride when I started of this whole array was uh, 200 and or this one element was 208 byte. And 208 byte, if I have a million of those, would have been 250 megabytes, which is too much. So uh, what do we do? First, we think to back to like, calc not, you know when you think back to your first uh, programming lessons where they talk about integers, and that actually there's not just one integer, but you have the so-called int 8, that's the name in Swift, uh, which is actually one byte or eight bit. And that's why I was confusing earlier with the element 8, because this is a uh, exactly one byte. It's called car in C, C-H-A-R, and um, it, you can store integers up to 127 in there, up to the number of 127, and then it uh, increases in size, and we can look at, okay, there's an integer 16, which has 16 bit, which is two byte, which is, uh, can store numbers up to 32,000, and then we have integer 32 max, and then we can store up to two billion, and then we have the integer itself, which is nothing else than an integer 64, meaning it is 8 byte big or 64 bit. And uh, this can store numbers up to this size. Um, and I guess some of you maybe who have worked with uh, more web development, when you do like an SQL database, you also sort of think about these things, because if you don't need a large uh, a column to be very large, you use the smaller types. And um, this is really what I did. Uh, when I did, was designing the struct, before I started any optimization, I sort of did a little bit of premature optimization myself, which, as I just told you before, we shouldn't do. Um, and I already, if you look at this uh, big uh, struct here, I already said, okay, my databases don't have uh, billions of stars. They have never, they will never have billions, so I'm totally fine with using uh, the um, integer 32 or the four byte integer size. And um, I thought this is like a little bit optimized, but um, then I realized that uh, floats are also four byte, and uh, we can look at doubles. Doubles are the double size of a normal float. That's, that's why they're called doubles, and they are eight byte. And then I also checked, apparently strings are 24 bytes, um, regardless of size. There are some uh, Small strings can fit in those 24 bytes, and larger ones then are, have a pointer that goes somewhere else in memory. So this is just uh, apparently a swift way. Strings are always 24 bytes. Um, and what we can we do now is we can look at all these numbers and sum them up, do a little bit of algebra. OK, we learned, OK, 4 bytes, and then we have 8 bytes and 24. And then we can count the ones that we just saw. So we had four strings of 24 byte, we had uh, eight uh, floats and integers, and we had four doubles, and then overall we calculate, okay, this uh, struct should be 152 byte. Who paid attention earlier to how big this struct was actually? Uh, we saw that this actually, like the memory layout said, it's 208 byte. 
So now we have calculated, okay, it should be 152, but it's really 208. And we're like, oh, uh, shit, something went wrong. We, we, we don't, something we don't really understand yet, so we have to go more into more detail with our uh, program. This, um, do you have any, any ideas, any like suggestions? Yeah, that will be the focus of the talk from now on. Yes, the order is very important. But maybe first, if you look at it, uh, there's another thing in Swift, uh, which is call, called optional, which is, of course, our favorite type that we have as any Swift developer is the optional type. And we realize, OK, obviously, optionals also need a little bit of space in memory. And um, so first, we think, OK, maybe um, Everyone, I, I assume everyone has seen how an optional is defined. It's just none or something, and it's really an enum. And then we can ask, hey, memory layout, what's really the size of an integer versus an optional integer and a string versus an optional string? This enum just adds one byte, which is sort of efficient. I mean, they could have done it in one bit, but that would have been weird, so uh, one byte's fine. Um, and now we can say, okay, you know, then we just remove those bytes. So we say, uh, we have a um, so-called like um, not available number. Let's say our database never has a minus value. So we say minus one means it's not available. So instead of storing them as a nil, we store them as minus one and we remove all the integers. But then we also have to make sure that we um, stay safe because we don't want uh, to have um, these uh, minus one uh, variables accessible. So we, we write a public getter and we write a private method. Uh, the, the, the variable itself is private and we write a public getter. So the public getter, it's still optional. So to the person who's using our API from the outside, nothing has changed. It's just internally that we optimize this. So this way we removed all the uh, optionals. You see there's no more optionals there. And we checked the stride. And now actually the funny thing is, uh, we see another problem because we removed nine optionals and we have a gain of 48 uh, bytes. So nine optionals that are all one byte and we gained 48 bytes. So we're like, again, huh, something happened again, which we still haven't really understood. So there must be something in here that we really have to deep dive. We removed nine optionals, we gained 48 bytes. What's going on? Um, and then we can think back, okay, before C was around, we were programming Objective-C, and Objective-C is really C, and really Swift is also underneath all it comes down to C. And uh, it turns out that uh, Swift works the same way um, in this sense. So uh, modern CPUs, when they put things into the memory, they lay them out in particular orders, and also they don't like things to be in like uneven numbers. So um, there's a thing called alignment, memory alignment. That means a character, which is an integer eight, one byte, can start anywhere because it's really just at every, at every byte. A short, which is two bytes, can start at uh, every second byte, and the float can start at every fourth, and so on. I can maybe add uh, this here, so we say, okay, you now an integer eight, it has an alignment which is one, which means we can have like many integers eight and they will all start at the right spot. And then there's this alignment of two and four and eight, but at eight it stops. So eight is the maximum alignment on these variables. Um, this all sounds a little bit complicated. Let's give you a nice little picture of how this looks in memory. So uh, this is something we might all have in our program. We have a struct user. First name is not optional. Middle name is optional. Not everyone has a middle name. And then we have a last name, which is also not optional. And then we can get the stride and say, OK, this is 80 bytes. Why is this 80 byte? Well, if we look into the memory, this will, it will look like this. There's the first name. Then there's this optional with 25 bytes. So it goes just a little bit into this next 8 byte uh, block here. And then there's the last name. And this is the whole size of our struct. This is the way that the, uh, Swift will put this in memory. We, we see we have this little bit of unused memory here. And um, then we can play with this and we can say, OK, let's think about a very badly aligned example. So this is just another, I don't know, somewhere in your program, you might have something that has a is hidden Boolean, a size, and it is interactable, an H. And you check the stride and it's 32 byte. And if you look into memory, this is how it looks in memory. 
because a Boolean can start anywhere, but then the double can only start at the 8, as well as the integer. So we have this very huge gaps here. We can reorder, and this is the part where you really like look at this badly aligned one and now look at the next one. So the well aligned one has exactly the same variables, it's just that I changed the order of the variables. And by changing the order, I, make the, I went move this one over here, and now we have way less me memory uh, wasted. And our overall stride went down from 32 to 24 byte, which is, of course, 25% uh, better. So we just changed the order of our variables. And you can think of, if you do this a lot, if you have a large struct and you order them just completely randomly, you have a lot of these gaps. And then uh, by just ordering them nicely, all our little variables, we can m make the memory of our program go down. And this seems really weird, because we as programmers, we like, why should it matter what is the, the order? But then it's like Swift is using the same stuff that C was using, and C really had this thing. So it's like all going back to very low machine uh, level things happening in the memory. I also have links in the end if you want to know more. For me, when I looked at this, it's a little bit like playing Tetris. It's like, you know, you have these, these gaps, and you want to move these blocks in there, and you want to make sure that everything is nicely, and there's no, no more holes in your, in your structs. And uh, this way we can use, so I, I say it's like a little bit, it's fun because it's like playing Tetris with structures. But really, um, in the end, if we align our data now, you can see that the only thing I did is like I put all the small ones in the front, and then all the, like this is all 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, then 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, and then 24, 24, 24. So we now have uh, a nicely aligned uh, structure. So this, the Tetris game is here is very simple because you really just move them uh, in order of size, and you, you're fine. And um, uh, then we get a stride at 152. So now we're like, huh. We didn't save that much, but it was because when we had those optionals, we had this one extra byte that was creating lots of extra holes in our database. So our uh, database then looked very much unoptimized. And we can think about what else we can do. So we went from 208 to 152. That's 25% less memory. But it still doesn't really help us with the 500 megabytes. We would now be at like 350 or something. Not much better. And then another topic uh, when it comes to optimizing your code is domain knowledge. You really like think about what your particular problem is. That is, goes back to this other thing I said earlier, if you have like this turn-based game where the user might just sit in front of a screen where nothing happens, then you as a, as a developer know about the domain that it doesn't matter uh, whether you show 0 or 64 uh, or 60 frames per second. And um, in our case, we can look at the big structure that we had right now, and we realize that really most of the memory goes into the, the bottleneck here are those strings. And we can look at those strings, and I actually know as a domain knowledge for me is oh, actually many of these strings are empty. Uh, very little, very few stars have real names. That's like those Vega, Arcturus, uh, DNAP, um, all, the, all these famous ones. But there's only 146 of those. Uh, only 3,000 have... Uh, Gliese ID. Gliese is famous because they, they keep on discovering new planets around the Gliese planets. That's why you might have seen this in the news somewhere. And um, there's these other classifications. But all of these strings that we used only have a very limited amount of actual uh, strings. So we can say, OK, let's move all these strings into a separate dictionary. And then, uh, so while we are loading the database, we move all the strings into a dictionary, and we have an index. And inside our struct, we just store the, like, instead of storing the whole Gliese number, the Gliese, like, 66B, uh, we store just a number to this dictionary. And now we have a dictionary that's integer to string. And again, if there is a minus one, that means it's nil. So we use the same approach we had before. And again, we write a nice public getter, and this variable here will be the private one. So we hide this complexity from the user and uh, create a nice assessor method. But we have to remember now, this is exactly this topic that I said earlier, when we optimize our code, we often make it more complex. 
This really added a lot of extra complexity because I have to keep track of this extra dictionary. We have to make sure that never to uh, uh, mess up this dictionary because then we suddenly would get the wrong strings. And this actually happened to me. One of my tests failed because uh, the strings were not the correct ones anymore. So that's why it's good to have unit tests while you're optimizing things. And maybe this dictionary lookup here makes our uh, CPU do more work. Because before we could just get the number, but now we need to access the, the array. And so it depends. In my case, I actually rarely access the strings. I only really need to access them when someone taps on a star, and then I need to show them what the name of the star is. And so uh, this was a good idea. And it's a good example of these cases where the memory and the CPU go against each other a little bit. Like you have to think about, OK, what do I need really? Um, and so now I changed all of these strings to integer 16, because as you have seen, we only needed about 4,000 of those. So integer 16 were fine, was fine. And then we have uh, a, our whole struct down to 64 byte, which is much, much less. And we can ask ourselves, are we done? Is there something else we can think of? Well, it's a trick question because basically what we need to do is the same thing again. Because uh, these ones are uh, two bytes, two bytes, two bytes, two bytes, and we before just learned that the small ones should go to the front. So we should really like move stuff around again. So uh, we see we have uh, the small ones with the four bytes at the front, and then we have um, Actually, there might even be a mistake in here, but in any case. Um, so we moved things to the front, and we have uh, the larger ones to the back, and now we have an overall stride of 56. And uh, if we look at the overall winnings from this lecture now, we see we started with 208 byte per entry, and we went down to 56 byte per entry. So maybe if we think about those 500 megabytes we had, we went down from 500 megabytes to 130 megabytes, roughly. And um, I think that's great, because it's really for our program. That means that we can have it on a normal iPhone, where before we had problems. So that's for this example. One reminder, as again, keep in mind you want to keep your runa tests running after every step, so that while you're doing something, you're not messing up the actual logic of your code. And you uh, can be sure that you didn't break anything. Always be safe. And with the unit tests, you can like sleep safely. You can like optimize your code, and then you can go back to home and be like, oh, I know I didn't break anything. And again, think about uh, Donald Knuth. Knuth. Premature optimization is the root of all evils. Um, so if you now learn from me that to do this structure optimization, and you go back to your programs, if you have in your app maybe a set of 20 users, please don't go in there and change the variable order. Because if you have 20 users, it doesn't matter whether this is like one megabyte or two megabytes, because it's still going to be like 20 or 40. That, that doesn't matter in the range that we are right now. It matters that your order of like the elements and your struct is easily readable to a developer who comes after you. So. No, please, please don't go ahead now and say, oh, this guy at this conference said uh, should put the small ones front and the left. <laughs> only if it's necessary, only if it's big. So maybe if you have a media library of a thousand movies, you have to think about it. Maybe there's a media library, each entry is one megabyte, and then you can maybe get it down to 500 kilobytes. That makes sense. But if there's movies of about one kilobyte, it again doesn't matter. Think about hard about it. And so. Maybe you have a server-side Swift app with a million entries. Yeah, totally. Then go ahead and, and do this. And uh, as we saw earlier, if you have a server app and you have less memory, that means you have to pay less money because you fit on a smaller machine. And maybe, I don't know, example, if you have a procedurally generated content somewhere in your game and it's millions of entries, then you also want to optimize them. So, but the point to learn from this is, uh, don't do this all stuff that I showed you just now just because it's fun. Do it when it's necessary. But it's fun for me. I don't know if it will be fun for you. Yeah, there's this example with MapKit. So this is all, yeah, this is all about um, this particular case of optimization. Um, I have one extra for you that is also about optimization, but not optimization for the user but it's about optimization for us developers. Mm. 
Coup here is in the project where if you change something in your app and you click build, you're like, oh no, now Xcode takes like two minutes to build my project. I'm like sitting here idle, like who has a project that is taking too long to build? Yeah, that's what I expected. And so uh, one thing uh, I did in most of the companies I worked for is I applied the same idea of optimization to the compile time of the Swift app. Uh, you wouldn't, this is not something where you'd compile for, uh, this is also in the slides that you can then check on my GitHub page and everything, so you don't have to write this down real quick right now. Um, this is like the, the program that I usually use, the, the, the command line method, um, and all this does is it tells Xcode to uh, check the compile time for each individual function and write it down into a text file and also order it before it uh, writes it. And I actually do this a lot uh, with uh, our programs, and we actually check sometimes. This is a program that actually looks sort of fine. This is like the output of this method. We can see there's like a Cocoa Pot, the Swifty Beaver thing, uh, where there's like some, uh, some hashing going on, and the hashing function is maybe complicated. I have seen individual methods of three lines of code taking two seconds to compile. Uh, this often happens when you use a lot of uh, um, type inference. So if you have like a, a closure in a closure in a closure and you never actually specify which types are going on, then Swift is like really sitting in front of this thinking very hard what your types might be. So it's really about when the developer would sit in front of this, be like, oh, what are the types here actually? It's usually Swift also have problems. But again, only the stuff that really is a problem you should optimize because usually you want your program to be easily readable by humans and not easily readable by the Swift compiler. But sometimes this can be really helpful. I remember I had projects which I took from five minutes to two minutes of compilation time just by adding a few more variable uh, types in places that Swift would otherwise infer. Um, yeah, so this is like a really small helpful thing for you maybe as a, as a sidetrack from the general uh, app optimization to uh, Xcode optimization. Um, another nice thing is I have a, uh, Earlier, I showed you the demo where I showed you this ARKit app of all of us, but it's also s the same application goes if you go to a server-side Swift app. Um, I have an, a server-side Swift app running right now. If you go to this URL, you get a nice API where you can again check where a star is in the, in the sky. And this again um, uses the same uh, framework that we just optimized. And again, we benefited a lot from getting the size down because we were able to, uh, this is running on like an IBM Bluemix server, which is the free tire because I didn't, um, yeah, for like less than 500 megabyte memory size, you don't have to pay anything. So because I optimized this down, I can now have a, an API that runs completely for free, which is also great, I think. Um, and like to recap, um, what did we learn today in this whole talk? Um, the first really important thing is that I cannot stress too much, pick your battles wisely. I have been in many code reviewing sessions where people were like, yeah, but if you write it like this, then the variable only has to be calculated once and not twice. And I'm like, but this method will be called two times in your entire app run cycle. Why do we change this order here just so that these two times this variable is not again initialized? So only talk about optimization when you have done the profiling. Pick your battles. Also. If you have a problem, pack your structs tightly. So pick your battles wisely, pack your structs tightly. You can play Tetris, but it's really about putting the small ones in the front. Um, know your doma domain and utilize what you know about your domain. So really think of hard, what do I need, what don't I need, and maybe I can make some cut some corners in your program. Um, carefully balance memory versus uh, CPU see what's your current problem, what's like is maybe you're more uh, memory constrained or maybe you're more CPU constrained, and again, profile first. Mm -hmm. I have some links uh, for you. So there is, of course, a very nice um, uh, sum up of, uh, this, is the, the, this is the link where I got the Donald Knuth uh, um, quote from, there's a lot more examples why premature optimization is bad. Um, we have a very nice summary on the lost art of C structure packing. Um, yeah, when I learned first about this, for me it was also 
something that I lost because I had worked on this 10 years ago, and since then I had not done this, so yeah, it's a lost art. And um, there are some really nice Apple um, documentation with some nice playgrounds about how to write high-performance code in Swift. And we also have uh, Swift Array Design. This helped me a lot because by looking into how the arrays are built in Swift, I was able to understand how the Swift uh, stride and uh, mm, sizes work. And um, you can also check all this talk and get all the playgrounds. I was thinking of doing some live coding here, but it would have been hard with the time. So uh, there's the live. Uh, the playgrounds to this talk and the example project for this uh, memory um, optimization thing are in this uh, talk on my GitHub. Um, and also the um, underlying database for these stars is also available on GitHub. So if you want to play around with this, it's all open source. And the same, um, there's a related talk that I did before about KD structures. This is like space partitioning trees um, that interlinks with this talk that I did today very much because they both sort of lead to uh, you being able to show uh, spatial data nicely. And that's it actually. So I'm, I'm through. I'm good in time. I think the guys in the back will be happy about me. And um, this is again my GitHub. This is my Twitter. And I'm really happy that uh, for the conference for my viewers to invite me and to give me this chance to talk to you today. Yeah. Thank you. Друзья, у нас есть время для одного вопроса. Кто? О, там рука. Повезло. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, Tetris game is looks like a good spot for optimization. Why compiler doesn't do it for us? The compiler. Yeah, compiler. Yeah. I some, don't. Some kind of property or, uh, for build. So that I think the type inference is a problem where there is basically similar to AI, where it basically goes down a uh, kind of um, a tree. So it basically really has, to, sometimes when you have a closure, you could really have several types that like for, X, for um, Swift could be applicable there. So it basically explores a tree of possibilities. And then at some point it comes, okay, this, this one fits everything because it, like it looks for your smallest closure. Okay, there's like five ty types that your variable could be in this closure. And then it checks in the one above, could it still make sense in the closure above? I could give another talk about this. It's like, because I think that's, w that's what I saw from the, from the, if you actually stack a lot of closures, if you nest closures and you, ne you leave out the types, you know, you don't have to say the input type nor the output type. So your code could be really many things inside one yes, closure. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't so, express my thoughts, my, my question, right? My question was about uh, Tetris game. So Tetris game, uh, you saw it, is a good spot for automatization. That's, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, a common problem from about decades ago. Why compiler doesn't do this Tetris game for us? Why it doesn't switch uh, variables, properties, member? Why should we do this? We could open an open radar and ask them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think there was a question back there, no? No, not I. Okay, not I. No, okay. Uh, thank you.